Hey there, adventurers. Picture this. Our hero saves a wild world, becomes a legend, but then, boom. Back to square one as a baby in his boring old world. But hold on to your hats because guess what? Fate pulls him back into the wacky world again. Get ready for a roller coaster ride as our ex hero turned high schooler gets sucked back into the adventure of a lifetime. Grab your snacks and buckle up, it's gonna be nuts. The story starts with Setsu, a doubtful kid without parents, and Toma, his friend who isn't too sure about things either. Suddenly, they get called to another world named Destinia by the king, who sees them as heroes. Even though Setsu is hesitant about this new place, they decide to stay and learn how to survive and fight against monsters. Setsu is practical and doesn't worry much about things being fair, instead he focuses on doing whatever needs to be done. Because of the tough times they face together, Setsu and Toma promise to stop the fighting and bring peace. Five years later, the princess asks for help from students from another world. They aren't sure if they are skilled enough but agree and find safety in a castle. Meanwhile, Setsu praises Yudi's magic talent and learns about dangers from Elka, who can transform into a chair. Glean and Tia suspect Toma's involvement in making things complicated for them. Glean talks about God's will, and Setsu thinks about Toma's fate. In the throne room, the king declares war on demons, regretting the past peace treaty. Glean urges patience, and Setsu insists on going alone to stop the war. The next day, Setsu and friends sneak into the palace to get his sword and leave. Yui wants to join Setsu, but he leaves her behind for her safety after a heartfelt goodbye, determined to complete the dangerous mission. There's a girl named Ruri. Her grandfather, who was a famous jeweler in Dizia, recently passed away. Before he died, he asked Ruri to fulfill his last wish, which was to deliver his final masterpiece. So Ruri leaves her home to do just that. While she's on her journey to deliver the masterpiece, a scary monster attacks her carriage. Just when things look really bad, Setsu shows up just in time to save her. Ruri is really thankful for his help and asks him to come with her to the next town to keep her safe, and Setsu agrees to protect her. When they get to Port Town, Ruri tries to find a ship to go to the Demon Continent. But she can't find any because all the trips there are cancelled because of the war that's going on. Ruri runs into some mean royal knights who try to bother her and take her stuff. But Setsu steps in and makes them look silly in front of other people, so they leave her alone. Later, at an inn before Ruri goes to take a bath, she shows Setsu the item she's carrying. When Setsu looks at it, he realizes it's a necklace from his past life. And he had put a protective spell on it as a gift for a friend. He hopes nothing bad happened to that friend. Later that night, the royal knights come back to the inn and try to blame Setsu and Ruri for being on the side of demons, and they want to arrest them. Setsu and Ruri manage to run away, and after a wild chase, they find themselves trapped. In brave move, they jump into the ocean and call Setsu's old friend Leviathan, who was a water dragon and goddess of the ocean. This shocks and scares the knights. Leviathan agrees to take them across the sea to the demon continent. They arrive at the continent and Levaya defeats a big sea monster called a Kraken, and then turns into a young woman named Levaya. Setsu introduces her to Ruri, and Levaya scolds Setsu for not helping. Setsu says sorry by making fried squid from the Kraken. During this time, Ruri reveals her real client, Diesel D. Sereno, who is actually the current demon lord and an old friend of Setsu and Levaya. Some demon kids come, so Setsu shares the squid with them to not waste it. They take the Kraken to Vol Village, where everyone is getting ready to fight it until Setsu shows up, and they celebrate. Meanwhile, Vlad's bodyguard sees the party and thinks the village is being attacked. At the party, Ruri and Levea talk, and Levea says she met Setsu five years ago and traveled with him. Ruri is surprised to learn that Setsu is the hero who ended the war. She also sees that Levea likes Setsu, but is mad he disappeared for five years. Vlad comes to the party and embarrasses himself. He apologizes for his earlier actions and asks Setsu to save Dessas, who has been cursed and forced to marry Terran Sneer. Terran claims he can make peace since humans attack demons first. Ruri tells everyone that Sneer is the richest human merchant, not Setsu, and Levaya agrees to help. They start their journey, and along the way, Setsu thinks there might be a conspiracy behind the war using Terran's power because humans think demons attack first. Finally, they reach the Demon Lord's castle. Demon Lord Dessas, who fought against Setsu in the previous war, fell in love with him, which helped end the conflict. Setsu gave her a necklace as a symbol of a fresh start, and then disappeared. When she heard that Setsu was gone, she worked hard to keep the peace he had brought. But one day, her special necklace broke mysteriously. She sent it to get fixed, but it never came back because a new war started. Suddenly, Terran offers a peace deal, but he wants to marry Dessas in return. Dessas reluctantly agrees, but she's forced to wear a cursed necklace, that makes her obey Terran like a slave. Terran doesn't care about the war, he just wants to control the demon continent. 
On their wedding day, Terran tries to put the cursed necklace on Deces, but Setsu shows up just in time to stop it. Leviah deals with Terran's guards, but one escapes to tell others about what happened. Deces is thrilled to see Setsu again, and Setsu is glad she's safe. He destroys the cursed necklace, which was made by Toma. Setsu tells Deces he's going to meet Beast King Regulus, and she wants to go with him, but he wants her to stay and do her duties. Ruri arrives and gives the necklace to Setsu, who puts it back on Deces, renewing their promise of peace. Later, Terran gets arrested and Deces asks Setsu for a date after the war. Ruri gets permission to open her shop in Dizia's kingdom. Setsu and Levaya leave to find Regulus. Setsu and Yugi became friends when they were kids despite Setsu being a bit distant at first. They lived next to each other and grew closer over the years. One day, Yui jokingly suggests they go to the same high school after seeing a prep school poster. After talking about it, Setsu suggests she should consider a less challenging school. Even though Yubi struggles in prep school, she's determined not to give up. Now, Yudi is doing really well in magic training. Meanwhile, Elka admires Setsu and wants to be close to him. But she sees Yui also wants to spend time with Setsu. Elka tells Setsu about his peaceful world and his ongoing fight, offering to help whenever he needs it. Yui also wants to help Setsu and asks Elka for a mock battle to improve her skills. They fight with swords and magic until Elka stops it, impressed with Yui's progress. Elka takes Yuvi to the castle sewers to face a monster to toughen her up. Even though Yuvi is scared, she fights the monster, learning about protecting loved ones in war. Tia understands Yui's feelings but worries about her safety. Yuvi says she wants to repay Setsu for helping her in the past. Tia wishes her luck. Glean talks to Yui about her skills on the battlefield, but Elka worries about potential dangers. Glean talks about the difficulty of taking lives and tells Yui to find her reason to fight. This makes Yui think. During training, Yui surprises everyone with her improved magical powers. She goes back to the sewers with Elka and shows determination by dealing the monster without killing it. Impressed, Elka agrees to train her more. In the throne room, Glean says they're going to the Demon Kingdom the next day. The group not fully prepared after brief training gets ready mentally and physically. Yui, determined, asks Setsu to wait for her. Setsu and Leviathan travel to the Beastman continent. Leviathan, the god of the seas, plans to handle boat duty while Setsu suggests teleportation magic, but Leviathan dismisses it. They joke about getting cookies as compensation. Setsu's pupil, Eliz, and her sister, Armel, join them. Elida shares her recent dragon-slaying quest, but declines the invite to the continent because of an ongoing situation. In a flashback, Eliz stays at Armel's house and talks about her brother's disappearance since the dragon appeared. Setsu wonders if the dragon killed him, but Elias doubts it, saying villagers vanish without a struggle. Elias disabled the village ward to lure the dragon, but Armol warned against it. Elias injured the dragon, but it escaped, and when she returned, everyone was gone except Armol. Elias's goal is to find Armol's brother. Leviathan suggests zombies is a possibility, but Setsu questions it. Leviathan jokes about air zombies, but Setsu wants to be serious. Leviathan suggests sirens as another possibility. As they head to the Beastman continent, Armel detects sea monsters by their smell. Setsu playfully suggests space aliens, but Leviathan insists on being serious. Setsu theorizes that the dragon might be an advanced species taking human form. Elias questions Leviathan's dragon status, jokingly claiming to be the god of the sea. Setsu wonders why the dragons spare Armel. They stop at Zaslo, where Elias plans to investigate missing villagers. Sexa questions why the dragon keeps attacking and Leviathan suggests powerful magic might attract it. Setsu theorizes that transfer magic drew the dragon. Elias mentions someone arriving two years ago. Armel dismisses suspicion, but Setsu reminds her of the sea monster smell comment. Elias explains that demons share a similar sense of smell. Sexa questions how Armel recognized Leviathan's true nature. Leviathan combines magic with Setsu's sword and Elias defeats the dragon. Later, Setsu rides Leviathan toward the Beastman continent, reassuring Leviathan that Elias can handle things. In Zaslo, Elise is surprised to see Armel alive, who reveals she turned villagers into dolls for the war, needing their strong magic power. Story shifts to Leopold, a busy town in the Beastman continent. Shiro, popular for aiding supply chains in the market, declines numerous gifts. When children ask her for monster fighting lessons, she refuses, saying it's not her job. Shiro goes home to take care of her sister Miniko, determined to make her better. Meanwhile, Setsu urgently looks for a boat but finds none available. He suggests riding Leviathan, upsetting her. Setsu apologizes and convinces her. Tomorrow, a boat will be available. Setsu decides to find an inn and apologizes to Leviathan. Shiro enters an inn and thanks Kuro for medicine. 
Setsu asks Kuro for restaurant recommendations and Shira has dinner with her sister, Mineko, who hasn't eaten much. Shiro urges Mineko to rest, revealing her cursed necklace. At the inn, Kuro sees Setsu and Leviathan asleep, so Shiro decides to act. Shiro proposes living as sisters after completing their mission and Kuro agrees, giving Setsu's room key. Shiro confronts an illusion of Setsu, who suspects Toma's involvement and gently subdues her. Back home, Shiro remembers Setsu's help and Setsu reveals Mineko's curse by Toma. Shiro vows to help and learns about Setsu's sword, Glutton. Setsu uses Glutton, causing Mineko discomfort. Kuro attacks, Shiro intervenes, Setsu continues, and Leviathan battles Kuro. Shiro questions Kuro's motives. Kuro insults her and reveals Toma's plan to become a god, eradicating all species. Leviathan doubts Toma's capability, but Kuro insists, using a flash bomb to escape. Kuro notices Mineko's recovery. Setsu recognizes the cursed necklace from disaster. Setsu vows to stop Toma, a dangerous individual aspiring to become a god. The scene shifts to Leviathan and Setsu on a boat, planning to meet the Beast King. Shiro and Mineko join, expressing their determination to fight. Setsu warns them, but they're resolute. Setsu welcomes them, and they journey toward the capital. Setsu once challenged Ro, the daughter of the Beast King, to a duel, but he emphasized that he wasn't seeking mastery. In the present, conflict erupts in the royal capital regdom. Beastmen discuss whether to invade or defend. Ro leaves and Setsu arrives, facing skepticism from guards. Shiro, Mineko, and Leviathan vouch for him. Ro tries to attack him sneakily but fails. Setsu denies being her master. Shiro, Mineko, and Leviathan confirm Ro's identity, and they enter the capital. Inside, Ro expresses concern about Setsu's five-year absence. Setsu briefly explains showing affection to Ro. King Regulus welcomes Setsu, and they exchange banter. Regulus suggests a duel, but Setsu declines, revealing Toma's threat. Regulus offers help, but Setsu prefers him as a backup in the capital. Ro wants to help, but there aren't enough people to join Setsu's mission. Lubazu Dorado, army commander, claims to be Ro's fiancé, which she vehemently denies. Disagreement arises among the beastmen, but Regulus trusts Setsu. Luva questions Setsu's loyalty due to his absence, Regulus suggests a duel officiated by himself, with the winner marrying Ro. Luga accepts and the duel is set for the next day. Regulus apologizes, saying there's no other way to convince the beastman. Ro asks Setsu for help discovering Luga's use of a protective rune. On duel day, there's enthusiastic support for Luga. The fight gets intense, but Luga taps into a cursed rune. Setsu warns about the curse, and the battle takes a dark turn. Feeling responsible, Ro considers drastic action. Setsu has a plan to stop the fight without killing, but Toma suddenly appears, disrupting everything. Toma reveals his destructive plan, and a confrontation with Setsu begins. The Zoo Dorado army prepares for a bigger mission to the Demonic Kingdom. Setsu and Ro commit to the mission, putting aside personal feelings. The scene shifts to five years ago after Toma and Setsu's fight. Toma survives the fight, causing Setsu to return to his original world. Hidden within the solemn sanctuary of an ancient temple, Toma seeks refuge from the relentless turmoil of his own existence. As he wanders through the sacred halls, his weary fingers brush against a forgotten relic, a necklace pulsing with an otherworldly energy. However, the necklace becomes an unexpected conduit to a haunting revelation. Its gem shimmers with an ethereal light, projecting scenes of anguish that play out like a tragic symphony. The vivid display paints a stark portrait of despair, revealing the innermost thoughts of those subjected to brutal trials. Their collective sentiment speaks of a world that has abandoned them a realm where they feel like misplaced entities yearning for a place that would embrace their existence. Some, overwhelmed by the weight of their suffering, harbor wishes so profound that they long to undo their very birth. This revelation strikes Toma like a bolt of lightning, shattering the walls of his solitude. A deep-seated empathy surges within him as he gazes upon the shared agony of those depicted in the gem. Determined to be their beacon of salvation, Toma's weariness transforms into resolute purpose. He will no longer remain a passive observer. Toma is shocked to see others like him and decides to save them. He attacks the building where they're held and the scientists flee, leaving the test subjects behind. Toma demolishes the building and tells them they're free. He invites them to join him in changing the world for the better since they've all been rejected by it. The story returns to the present, and Toma's wounds have healed. He queries his comrades about readiness for God in this world, preparing for war with a vast fleet. Destinian ships head towards the demon continent, causing widespread concern. Summoned students, Gleam, and others join the conflict under the king's orders. A soldier announces imminent landfall, emphasizing the war's authorization by their great king. Tia senses Toma's magical power, identifying him as true adversary. 
Gleam plans to flank, mages bombard the defensive wall, and humans launch an attack, ultimately breaching the wall. Tia advises caution and Elcut explains the strategy to the students. Uncertain, the students join the battle in their first war, realizing it's a critical moment. One girl lags, pleading not to be abandoned. A demon targets a girl, but Yudi saves her with fire magic. She apologizes and Yuhi reassures her, advising against pushing too hard. As demons retreat, Yui prevents classmates from killing a wounded one, opposing harming the defenseless. Meller, admitting to turning Elise into a doll, plans to puppet everyone. Meller introduces herself and the blood monsters attack Glane's group. They defeat two but face more. Tita handles magic soldiers, Yuki and others defeat monsters. Taya questions Meller's next move. Meller complains about their strength and sends Elise. Glane defeats Elise, Elka pierces Meller's organ. Meller, on the verge of death, refuses to succumb, standing defiant. Elka and Tia are baffled as Elka had pierced Meller's magic organ. Meller discloses her body modifications with an extended heart and magic organ, designed as a weapon through numerous experiments. The group dodges her attacks and Tia and Yui shield them from a breath attack with a barrier. With magic running low, the Chimera readies for another attack. Elise unexpectedly kills Meller, recalling shared happy times. Both Elise and the Chimera turn to stone. Elka tends to Elise's wounds, expressing relief. Taya notes Meller's surprising power, suggesting a break after the intense fight. Keijuru emerges, astonished at Meller's defeat. The group acknowledging his strength is sides against another battle. Yuri faces Keijuru with Tia, Glean, and Elka offering support. Before the clash, Setsu arrives, relieving Yui and taking charge. Keijuru recognizes Setsu as the hero and exposes his formidable aura, revealing him as the attacker of Disaster's palace. Setsu charges. Kuro takes down soldiers, Shiro and Mineko join. Shiro, seeing Kuro as a big sister, dodges her attacks. Kuro injures Shiro's face, targets Mineko. Shiro kicks, Mineko slams Kuro. Tentacles restrain Mineko, Kuro gains arms. Shiro calls Kuro her big sister. They break tentacles, fuse powers. Kuro mocks their efforts. Shiro confidently dashes past Kuro, declaring slim chances. Kuro summons more arms, sisters block. Kuro falls, recalls siblings, charges, defeated with a single strike, she lies motionless. The sisters revert. Meanwhile, Bildas faces demon soldiers, unfazed. Ro joins, surprised, determined to crush him, she kicks. Bildas remains unfazed. Ro hurts her leg, vows to break him. Ro unleashes a powerful aura, resolved to keep hitting until he yields. Bildas releases dark particles, revealing his body control ability. Iron pellets surround Ro, striking her, but she defiantly stands up, surprising Bildas. Running towards him, she endures hits, landing a solid punch on his face. Bildus recalls the Beast King's bloodline ability to burn life force. He hardens, vowing to crush her pride. Rose strikes break his armor. He impales her, but she destroys the spikes, driving her fist through him. Rose collapses, asserting a beastman's unbreakable pride. Bildus, calling her a fool, spares her life, healing her. Setsu claims superiority, but the opponent activates shadow armor, absorbing energy. Setsu strikes. The armor absorbs. The opponent punches Setsu away, who rises, destroys the armor, and calls him an idiot. Refusing to give up, the opponent charges and Setsu heals the final blow. Toma, determined, acknowledges his companion's defeat, resolute to conclude the story in this world. Leviathan hurries to check on Disaster, who notices that all of Toma's companions have been defeated. Toma rides, claiming that no matter what they do, things will end the same way. A struggle ensues and both girls are defeated. Setsu rushes to find his friends and Toma becomes jealous. Setsu thinks it's pointless to talk to Toma, but Toma claims they'll be the only ones left when he ends the world, with plenty of time to talk. Setsu charges at Toma, and they clash blades. Toma transforms his sword and hurls it at Setsu. Setsu bats it away, causing destruction. Leviathan is amazed, but Setsu asks if Toma is done warming up. Toma attacks with his aura, and Setsu defends himself. They exchange blows until Setsu disarms Toma. Toma transforms his sword into a cannon, creating a hole in the mountain. Setsu, shocked, realizes he needs to stop Toma. They fight in the sky, and Toma transforms his cannon into a gatling gun. Setsu summons Gluttony, absorbing the attack, gaining power, and counterattacking. Setsu's friends fight together. Toma, feeling alone, unleashes immense power, sacrificing life force. Setsu notices something strange. Toma goes all out, transforming his weapon and unleashing a devastating attack. Setsu tries to shield his friends but fails. Setsu fights back, destroying Toma's weapon. Toma transforms his weapon into a giant cannon, seemingly defeating Setsu. 
Toma laughs, thinking he has won. Setsu traps him with dimensional magic. Setsu uses his final skill to defeat Toma. Toma questions his actions, and Setsu explains he removed the curse to fulfill his promise to protect Toma. Toma reflects on his deeds, locked up, wondering about his punishment. Setsu decides to send everyone back to their world. Toma questions why he's still alive, and Setsu reveals his intent to give Toma a chance at redemption. Toma sends everyone back and stays behind to make amends. Setsu, Elka, Tia, and Yuhi embark on a new journey, excited about the future. And that's a wrap for today's tale. If you enjoyed the adventure of Setsu and his friends, be sure to hit that like button, share with your fellow adventurers, and don't forget to subscribe. Trust us, you won't want to miss out on the thrilling tales coming your way real soon. Thanks for tuning in.